Warning, this video contains flashing images. Welcome one and all back to my channel. We are back, my friends, for some three scary true Reddit stories. Now it is up to you guys and girls to believe them or not. I hope you will enjoy. Anyway, let's start the stories. If you have any ghost videos you would like me to react to, why not send them to my email address? Thank you very much. Thank God the door was locked. A story by Graves660. My aunt had recently gotten divorced and had just bought a new house in a new city. She originally lived in a big city in Tennessee and moved to a little quiet town. She invited us to come stay. My mom, dad, old sister and I. We are from Indiana, but we plan a trip to go stay. My cousins are just a bit younger than I am. I remember arriving and thinking this was kind of a creepy little town that had an eerie feel to it. There was no one around, very few cars, and no kids playing in the neighbourhood. It's the first night there and we all get settled in to go to sleep. My parents take my aunt's room, my aunt sleeps in one of my cousin's room. I sleep in one of my cousin's room with her and my sister sleeps in the living room with my other cousin. It's probably around 2am and my cousin and I are still up talking. We start hearing like a knock coming from the outside wall. We think it's just the wind considering their backyard is fenced in. I then mentioned to her how I felt I was being watched and she commented that she did too. So we assume it's just my little sister and cousin spying on us. We are all between 10 and 16 years old. A little while, probably 30 minutes-ish later, I hear my sister from the living room quietly calling from my aunt in a shaky voice. Although I'm the younger sister, I'm also the more protective sister, so I go running to the living room to see what's wrong and she points to the back door. I look over and we can clearly see the doorknob and door shaking violently. I run and get my aunt and as soon as she turned on the lights, the door stopped moving. We go get my parents and my dad goes outside and checks the whole house and finds scratches on the back door around the handle. It's creepy to think that this person was probably watching my cousin and I for a while before he decided to break in. I'm just thankful he didn't actually get in. We're also not sure how he got in the fence. It's a decently tall wooden fence with no gate. Needless to say, I didn't sleep the rest of that trip. I don't think anyone did. Thank you for the great support, I really do appreciate it. If you are enjoying what I'm doing why not think about subscribing to my channel, it is free and would help me a great deal. Big guy in a red sweatshirt. Story by Graves660. I was probably about 20 and I was babysitting for some decently wealthy people who happened to be good friends of mine. I was on the main floor. There was one little boy upstairs in bed and four older boys, eight and nine, downstairs playing video games. It was probably close to 11pm and there's a knock at the door. I can see it's a big guy in a red sweatshirt. I slowly crawl to the kitchen and grab the biggest knife I can find and go stand by the wall by the door where the man cannot see me but would have to walk past me to come in. I call the homeowner because they have that ring doorbell and this was when it was very new and few people had it so she can talk to the man through her phone. So she says I'll call you right back after I talk to him and then hangs up. Meanwhile, the guy's knocking aggressively now, and I'm praying none of the kids hears, as I don't want them to come upstairs or downstairs and scare them. My phone rings, and she says that she talked to him, and he said he was with Uber, not popular in this area at this time, 
Little for Angela, which ironically happens to be the homeowner's, my friend's name. But the last name was something weird. She said she told him that he had the wrong address and had to be on his way. However, he is still at the door. She stays on the phone with me until he walks away, which was several minutes later. We hang up as she thinks it was an honest misunderstanding. Meanwhile, I have this terrible, awful feeling in my gut, so I go to the door to watch for his headlights to leave. Their house is at the end of a dead-end road. I never saw the headlights leave, nor did I ever see a car. I laid on the couch, staring at the door until daylight at 7am when I finally fell asleep, only to be awoken by the kids at 8am. The whole time this big man was standing at the door, all I could think to myself was, I'm a 20 year old, 100 pound, 5 foot 3 inch female. You have to kill him. You come through that door, you have to give it your everything and kill him. You have to protect these five little boys. You have to stab him and don't stop. It's honestly a scary way to think, but the motherly instinct to me was telling me I have to save the kids at all costs. Thankfully, he never came back that night. I didn't have to test my strength. Demon Attack at Summer Camp Story by Belle Balor Back in 04, my family went with a church group to do some finishing work on some buildings for a summer camp in North Carolina. We were there for a week or so before we were supposed to head back home. As my family pulled in with our pop-up trailer, it popped a tire or broke something. I don't really remember what it was that broke. I just know that it wasn't going to make the trip back home to Central Florida. My dad contacted a place to repair it, but they were going to have to order or fabricate the parts to fix it. So it would take a month or two before we could get back to it. As the week ended, I felt compelled to stay for the summer and take on the role of camp cook. I was 19, but a decent hand in the kitchen. I grew up in a big family and had enjoyed cooking since I was a kid. I spoke to my parents, the associate pastor who had organised the church group trip, and the camp director and his wife. The wife of the director had planned to do all the bookkeeping, cooking and snack shop, as well as several other jobs. I had begun to feel like I had to take as much of her workload as I could. And I didn't want to take any money for it, since my parents were going to have to come back to the area to get their trailer anyway. I had their approval to stay, and once I had their approval, everyone else readily agreed to my proposal. The last night that the church group was there, I moved into the cabin with the rest of the camp staff. That night is one I will never forget, as long as I live. I don't want to talk about what happened at night because I sense the same presence still searching for me. In order for you to understand some of what happened, I need to preface the story with a description of the cabin itself. It is a cinder block building with two main rooms and bathrooms in the centre. Both rooms are separate and can only be entered from the main door. The cement floor is covered with tile and the beds are your typical summer camp bunk beds. Anything done in one of the rooms can easily be heard in the other. I had chosen the bottom bunk furthest from the door in the corner of the main room. We had two counsellors, two assistant counsellors, the camp nurse and the director's daughter, who was a general assistant, and myself in the room. The other side of the cabin was where the mayor counsellors and such were bunking up for the first week, when we all worked to get the camp ready for the first campers to show up. That first night, though, we joked around a bit and we got ready for bed. We could hear the guys goofing around in the adjacent room and proceeded to laugh about them. As we settled down to sleep, one of the counsellors, Jane, mentioned she had uneasy in complete dark and asked us to keep the bathroom light on for her, which we did. Once we were sure that she and a couple of others were asleep, we shut off the light and settled in to sleep ourselves. It seemed like mere moments to me, but was actually near an hour after I had fallen asleep. I awoke to Jane screaming 
and without seeing or looking, I knew she was sitting upright on her bunk, crawling at the massive hand on her throat. I also knew that all I had to do was to make it stop was to turn on the light. As I tried to get up to turn it on, I found myself pinned to my bunk by hands which covered my shins and forearms. He hailed me, immobile, with no effort at all. Suddenly I was looking directly at the door which flew open and slammed into the wall. At the same time, the whole room became engulfed in flames, white hot and stinking of rotten eggs and fish. As the stench and flames erupted into the room, a fire alarm began to screech. Jane was still screaming, and time was running out, as I could hear the life draining out of her screams. As suddenly as the door and flames had erupted into the room, I saw a shadow figure beyond the door coming in the room. The hulking creature, or demon, or whatever he was, curled his shoulders and spine to fit through the door, and once inside, he enfolded himself with a warrior's grace. In his right hand, he held an old-fashioned battle axe, the most vile and wicked weapon I've ever seen. As the creature stalked forward, I heard a maniacal crackling on either side of me. My captors were well amused. The thing before me spoke with a voice carved from the depths of hell, carrying more hatred and malice than I can accurately describe, saying, I will kill you all. You can never escape me. His laughter and voice still echo in my mind when I think about it. Just as he was raiding a killer blow to sever my head from my body, the light in the bathroom came on and everything vanished. Jane was no longer screaming but sobbing. The fire alarm went silent and the stench began to abate. I was suddenly able to move again. I had four large finger impressions on both my arms and Jane had a handprint on her throat. A couple of others also had handprints, and one said that something had been sitting on her chest. As we all spoke about what had just happened to us, the one who had been able to turn the light on said what the rest of us felt was a 15 minute to an hour experience had only taken mere seconds to play out. One of the others went to the men's room door and woke them to come check out our room and door. The two guys who came over said that they had heard nothing on their side of the cabin. No screaming and no fire alarm. They checked the battery and said that everything was fine. They dismissed the stories of what we said had happened as bad dreams and went back to their bunks. That was the last any of us spoke about it that summer. I think we all just wanted. No need to forget what happened. We all just acted like it was a bad dream. But I've never forgotten. I probably never will. I figured out that if I talk about it too late at night, I can feel the presence of the demon or creature stalking me still. I have only told a few trusted close friends. I also feel like the attack has something to do with the camp director's youngest son's death in the middle of last week of campers at the camp. Thank you very much for viewing my video. It is very much appreciated. We are on the way to 500 subs this year. Hopefully we shall actually get there. Anyway, my friends, here are some other videos you might like to watch. Until next time, scare you later.